choice comes from a place of spiritual maturity. What does this mean? It simply is living into a faith that can truly move mountains. You've heard that wonderful saying before, to move mountains, faith that can move mountains. These mountains are in some ways the weights of the world, the things that oppress us and the things we allow at times to become greater obstacles than they should be. If anybody has seen uh, one of the Lord of the Rings films, you remember that one scene where they're trying to traverse that uh, complex uh, mountain. I forget if it's the Andes or something like that, but they're, you know, uh, battling an avalanche and, um, you know, it's difficult. But this is how life is. Peter's sermon in today's snippet from Acts is post uh, what I like to call that floating kosher sheet conversion dream. And this is that dream where he, the Lord sends down the sheet, descends from heaven of all these different creatures that, you know, uh, he normally would not be allowed to eat and says, kill and eat. And he obeys. God is teaching him to live into his call as an apostle. Living into that special commission for Peter was to be and become all-inclusive in more ways than one, uh, through preaching, teaching, using the fruits of faith given through grace to realize the gospel in the world around him. The whole story of Peter, as beautifully painted by Luke in the book of Acts, is in itself an amazing witness, I would say, to what is the first creed, as we would hear as well in the Romans, I believe, uh, Jesus is Lord. What this means uh, to us individually, as well as the family of Christ, uh, is profound. We must remember as well that Luke, the Gospel writer, was not only a companion to St. Paul, but never actually witnessed, he was not an eyewitness to the story of Jesus. Peter was. His faith was built upon that powerful testimony, witness from Peter, to whom is credited for his eyewitness input in shaping the Gospels as a whole. I don't know how many people realize, but the synoptic Gospels, they're called, uh, Mark, Matthew, Luke, are shaped by that first witness that was their source, part of their source. We must also remember that we are a family of disciples who have been chosen and choose to abide in the law of love and to in turn live into love, grace recognized. Grace recognized in the biblical Greek literally means to grace meaning joy. Fascinating since there is little joy struggling to show itself in the world today. Uh, it's hard to be positive, to stay and incorporate that shining light of hope in a growing thicket of a graceless and godless wilderness that Satan is helping to build around us. Just look at the papers, the TV, the internet. There's an endless relay, an endless ticker tape of evil death and destruction, um, from ISIS uh, to here at our very own doorstep with neighbor against neighbor. If we all collectively recognized that the living reality of grace being a faith deeply woven into our soul, that Jesus is Lord, we could move mountains. We could clear out that wilderness and see life restored. A present resurrection of the heart convicted for Christ to use the means of grace to realize a love for God and neighbor that would be amazing. Amazing, all caps, extra bold, Hollywood size sign, reality. You've heard me use that metaphor a lot. Just imagine that now somewhere in Hollywood, that big giant sign that says amazing. And then grace in even bigger letters, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Motive, 
feeling, relationship that did, in fact, save a wretch like me. It saved us all. We could all share that indeed we have been lost, perhaps lost for a long time. Lost into ourselves, allowing the world to build those bricks of doubt and despair, pain and anguish. A place that can't see yet alone understand joy. What a hellish place, what a dark and lonely place that is. A purposeless place. How could we know love when often we allow the world to take away that capacity? That capacity to abide in God's living, restorative, resurrecting word. Clearing those mountains is much like going, looking into the past, but not being overcome by it. Easier said than done, right? Truth be told. But in order for us to be found, we must let go. We must let go of everything that is holding us back, from abiding in Jesus and freely living into the reality of grace. Being grateful, being gracious, demands deconstructing the self to be reborn spiritually and baptismally into a new kind of commitment that finds us, reestablishes us as truly children of grace. We will always have moments where we feel lost and alone, nearly hopeless and bewildered, right? But we are founded through a spirit that never leaves our side. What a wonderful thought. The Holy Spirit has been poured over us, is all around us, like the dust in the air. That reminds me of a beautiful Curcio talk I heard when I was making my first Curcio back in the fall of 2003, which was right after my conversion experience. Just about two months or so after that conversion experience, um, um, a dear new church friend of mine, Barbara, uh, had to nearly dra uh, drag me kicking and screaming to, uh, into making the Curcio uh, through the ecumenical Curcio community of Illinois. Uh, sadly, they have been gone now for some nine years. They uh, stopped in 2006. What was really funny uh, was how much I resisted in going. One of the beautiful moments, however, I experienced uh, with hearing Pastor Kathy's talk, which was just beautiful about the, just imagining grace like the dust in the air, has lasted with me. It has lasted with me in as well as recently how my ordination has been spiritually transforming, shaping and encouraging me. It's been a wonderful, encouraging memory for me to grow and go with God's living word, his imperative. Speaking of mountains, God's Holy Spirit placed me on that glorious mountaintop where my soul recognized his grace and founded a profound faith that is still growing, going forward, for the sake of the gospel. I can only attribute this to be out of love, truly, deeply, for God and neighbor. God's living and restorative word is what carried me, placed me on top of those mountains to where they're no longer looming over me or avalanching over me, but they were truly and spiritually underfoot. This is so otherworldly to believe something like this, or to believe like this, to harbor a faith like this. But welcome to the radical gospel of Jesus Christ. If you read the Beatitudes, they are beautiful statements of beautiful attitudes, but they are profoundly complex profoundly something that stretches us way past our capacity. Everything Jesus tried to teach us about God's imperative puts us to the test, puts us to the test spiritually, emotionally, physically, and so on. 
Our saints in ourselves constantly battle with being anchored in God's love. An anchor that is a solid foundation, the evil one often tries to chisel away the tuck pointing too. But we must continue to abide with a faith that builds, restores, and moves forward. One cannot truly move forward, though, if they are blinded by the ways of the world. In order for us to see, we must be truly free. Recognizing grace in your life is that freedom. It is a freedom that teaches the heart to fear no evil but overcome it. It is a freedom that brings peace, us peace, it brings us peace, relieves us from our bondage and pain. It is Christ's victory lived joyously, triumphantly, in our newly dedicated lives as children of grace. Peter's conversion experience this experience is talked about in the previous passages in the book of Acts were an aspect of the process of his spiritual maturity as a disciple, as an apostle of Jesus, which we are all in that role as well. If we truly believe in the priesthood of all believers, we are disciples, we are apostles. We must not forget uh, Peter's own story, that uh, he was a working class fisherman, right? Uh, became, then became a committed preacher, teacher, uh, living into the good news through a faith that was uniquely shaped by grace. All of us are led by God's grace, but it is an individual journey before it becomes a corporate journey together. A grace that Christ Jesus gave all of us. How precious did that grace appear the hour he came to believe? For some of us, we may know the day or hour we came to believe. For others, we are called to bring the good news to them. Precious is that faith given both as a victory and a promise from a loving and gracious God who has been good to us all. He saved me in more ways than one. My journey has been what has taught this to me, has brought me this far. God's pathway for you is similar, but it is between you and he. His living word secures our hope, as well as his will. Commandments are our strength and shield against evil. This is eternal. For God's timing is not our timing. The cross I'm wearing this evening is from uh, Kairos Outside Ministries. It is a ministry that uh, reaches out to um, women uh, with incarcerated family members. And um, it has on the back the same Curcio markings as the Curcio cross does. Christ is coming on you. And it's similar to a Curcio, but with a different bend, a different focus on, on perseverance, strength, and endurance. The wilderness of the world we have to struggle through and survive. At times it seems relentless and disparaging, where we nearly feel lost. We begin to feel lost at times. We must remember, though, with an abiding heart, it is the grace and love of God through the Holy Spirit that has kept us safe thus far, and grace will lead us all to recognizing that joy, the fruits of the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. But this isn't the end. It is the beginning of something greater. Let me leave you with a scene from that wonderful musical, Godspell. I love that film. The very first scene of the film makes for the most magical beginning for the disciples' journeys. Uh, for it has the John the Baptist character uh, calling people to prepare me the way of the Lord, which I have that as my phone ring, I love that. Uh, one by one he enters into a scene in their lives and uh, brings them to the fountain, 
uh, to be baptized. He calls a ballerina, a waitress, a cab driver, a businessman, a librarian, a grocery clerk, to name a few, and baptizes them, declaring the coming of Jesus to baptize them again with the Holy Spirit and with fire. A fire that is the passion of faith. They gathered and then scattered. This is the discipleship imperative, the goal, the, the will. The office without the walls and partitions or compartments. But a great and glorious frontier. There is no wilderness. A frontier for the gospel to grow and go, brought and lived through love and grace. 